Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hydrogen ions or protons have to be maintained within fairly constant levels in extracellular fluid and plasma for cells to live happily. And the constancy of the environment is what is meant by the term homeostasis. Cells need a fairly constant environment to live. There are countless molecules in the extracellular fluid in which the cells live in and we know about a few of those molecules, their levels and their normal ranges and what happens when the levels decrease or increase. And even fewer molecules we know of have to be maintained within a very narrow range. A good example is potassium levels in extracellular fluid. It has to be maintained within 3 to 5.5 millimoles per liter. Anything less than 3 or more than 6 would result in death if not managed. And protons have to be maintained in a very tight range as well. And notice that the proton concentration is in the nanomolar range in extracellular fluid, whereas potassium concentration is in the millimolar range. So this is about 100,000 times lesser. Let us take a convenient value of 40 nanomoles per liter for discussions further. Hydrogen ion concentration in plasma is 40 nanomoles or 40 nano equivalents per liter. But we are more used to the pH notation when we refer to acid base status of a solution. pH is the negative logarithm of the free hydrogen ion concentration in solution and for a concentration of 40 nanomoles per liter the calculations would be like this minus log 14 to 10 to the power minus 9 which gives you 7.4 sph and for this range of 35 to 45 nanomoles per liter the normal ph range would be 7.35 to 7.45 you know that the higher the hydrogen ion concentration, the lower the pH because pH is the negative log. And any inversion of numbers here is purely incidental in this case. So the normal pH range in which cells can exist and their enzymes can function is 7.35 to 7.45. And what are the extremes that can occur during life? pH cannot drop below 6.8 in a living organism. In mammals, while experimenting with rats, we have not seen pH less than 6.8 while the rat is anesthetized and is still living. The same is the case for human beings. A pH less than 6.8 during life is not reported. Likewise, the highest level of pH that is compatible with life is 7.6. But I've heard from at least one physician that he has been able to record 7.7 .7 in a patient with concomitant respiratory and metabolic alkalosis. So the pH range that is compatible with life is 6.8 to 7.6. And let us look at the actual hydrogen ion concentrations responsible for these pH values. At a, at a pH of 6.8, the hydrogen ion concentration would be 160 nano equivalents per liter, which is about four times that value. And at a pH of 7.6, hydrogen ion concentration is 20 nano equivalents per liter, which is about half the normal value. Now, this pH range of 7.35 to 7.45 has to be maintained in the extracellular fluid while 
acids are constantly coming into the extracellular fluid due to metabolism in the cells. Metabolic processes in the cells produce both acids and alkali, but there is a net excess of acids and in spite of that, the pH of the extracellular fluid is not altered. The phenomena responsible for this is what we are going to learn in this session. The hydrogen ions that come into extracellular fluid from cells obviously move into plasma, into blood and are carried by blood to the pulmonary circulation and are excreted by the lungs. They are also excreted by the kidneys. The excretory organs therefore for the hydrogen ions that are released by metabolic processes in the cells are lungs and kidneys. In this lecture, we will consider what are the metabolic pathways which release protons into extracellular fluid and therefore into blood. In the next few hours, we will see how while these protons travel in blood, they do not alter the pH of blood also. pH of plasma also has to be maintained within 7.35 to 7.45 because there are cells living in plasma, blood cells reside in plasma and plasma pH cannot change as well. So the bulk of the discussion in the next few lectures would be how hydrogen ions are buffered while traveling in blood. By buffered we mean how they are kept bound and not in the free state. It is only the free hydrogen ion concentration that contributes to acidity or the pH. And then we will see what are the roots of excretion through the lungs and the kidneys. So this will be the organization of lectures under the topic hydrogen ion homeostasis. We will now move on to metabolic pathways resulting in acid production. This is the blood compartment. I have shown liver and adipose tissue here, all other tissues and the brain on this side. Acids are produced when nutrients are broken down by cells to release energy. The major nutrient which serves as fuel for cells is glucose. I have shown these tissues on this side, skeletal muscle and all of the tissues and the brain because they are predominantly consumers of the fuel, consumers of glucose. I have shown liver and adipose tissue here because they can also generate some of the fuel required. When glucose is in excess in blood, liver can take it up and store it as glycogen and when there is need, it can release glucose into blood. So I have shown, shown these tissues on the right. Adipose tissue can provide free fatty acids as fuel. So we just saw that glucose is the primary fuel which cells use. Glucose is taken up by tissues in the presence of insulin. We have considered in the session on facilitated diffusion what the glucose transporters are on the cell membrane and which are the insulin dependent ones and which are the insulin independent ones. Predominantly glucose uptake by cells requires insulin. The glucose that enters cells undergoes glycolysis, a process which does not require oxygen and which happens in the cytoplasm to form pyruvate. Pyruvate then becomes acetyl-CoA which moves into the mitochondrion and acetyl-CoA goes through a series of reactions in what is called the tricarboxylic acid cycle or the citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle to release carbon dioxide and in the process forms ATP. Now for this process oxygen is required. So this is aerobic oxidation. The carbon dioxide that is formed during the process is put out into blood and that is an important source of acid because carbon dioxide will combine with water to form carbonic acid and carbonic acid will protonate to yield hydrogen ions. So carbon dioxide is an important source of acid which comes up due to complete metabolism of glucose going through glycolysis and further through the citric acid cycle. Now 
If there is not enough oxygen, for example, in conditions like exercise, where there is not enough oxygen for the exercising muscles, or shock states, where there is not enough blood supply to the tissues and therefore not enough oxygen delivery, there are other causes for reduced oxygen supply as well. They can be listed in a future lecture on hypoxia. So, when ox oxygen is in short supply, formation of ATP from the citric acid cycle will be less. You would have learnt at school that glycolysis itself can put out ATP. For every glucose molecule, the very process of glycolysis, where glucose gets converted to pyruvate, can release two ATP molecules. And subsequent processing of pyruvate in the citric acid cycle will generate 36 additional ATP molecules. But when oxygen is in short supply, mitochondrial output of ATP will be low and therefore, the cells have to enhance glycolysis so as to form more ATP. Now, all the pyruvate that is formed due to the enhanced glycolysis cannot go into the TCA cycle because of short supply of oxygen and all that pyruvate will become lactic acid and will move into blood. That is the next important source of acid into blood, of acid coming into blood. Lactic acid will also protonate and that is how the acidity of blood will increase or the pH will decrease. Now, what about conditions where glucose is in short supply? For example, starvation or diabetes mellitus. Let us consider starvation first. When external intake of food is less, initially there will not be hypoglycemia per se because the liver will put out glucose, break down glycogen in the process called glycogenolysis to release glucose into blood or form glucose from other sources like proteins and fats, a phenomenon called neoglucogenesis. By both these mechanisms, the liver will att attempt to put glucose into blood, but that will not be enough and the cells will need alternate sources of fuel. Diabetes mellitus is a condition of glucose excess in blood, but that glucose will not be available to cells because of insulin insufficiency. There is not enough insulin and the glucose that is there in blood in fact in excess cannot be taken into the cells. So, the cells are starved for glucose whereas there is plenty outside. So, in both these conditions starvation and diabetes mellitus, the cells need an alternate fuel because glucose is in short supply and that alternate fuel comes from adipose tissue where fats are met metabolized to form free fatty acids under the influence of a hormone sensitive lipase and the free fatty acids come into blood. They can be used as fuel by the cells because free fatty acids could undergo beta oxidation, form acetyl-CoA and enter the citric acid cycle. The free fatty acids which come into blood do not form an acid load in blood because they will be quickly taken up by the cells. Now, there is one issue here, the brain will not take up free fatty acids because they cannot cross the blood brain barrier. So, the brain needs another source of fuel in conditions where glucose is in short supply. That fuel required for the brain is given by liver. Free fatty acids are converted to acetyl-CoA in the liver and further converted to what are called ketone bodies. This term refers to a set of three compounds, acetone, acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyric acid. Of these, barring acetone, the other two, acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyric acid, can cross the blood-brain barrier and can be utilized by the brain for energy. Ketone bodies can enter the citric acid cycle at different points 
and the resulting acid from those processes is again carbon dioxide. But that is not all. Ketone bodies themselves are an important source of acid and blood. They can protonate and decrease the pH of blood. So, so far we have considered three sources of acid coming into blood, carbon dioxide, lactic acid and ketone bodies. These two come from glucose and ketone bodies come from fat metabolism. Let us consider protein metabolism. Proteins are absorbed in the form of amino acids in the gut. Amino acids are broken down to their amino group and the carbon skeleton in the liver. The carbon skeleton when required can serve as fuel. Different components of the carbon skeleton can serve as fuel and enter the citric acid cycle to provide energy. Carbon dioxide would be the resulting acid. There are other sources of acids from some of these amino acids. Sulfur containing amino acids like cysteine when metabolized will put out sulfuric acid and phosphoproteins when metabolized can generate phosphoric acid. So these are acids which come into blood due to protein metabolism. Not just this, the amino group has to be detoxified into urea, a soluble form which can be removed by the kidney. Detoxification of amino acids, though it can consume carbon dioxide, can generate a significant amount of protons which will form an acid load in blood as well. Now keep this in mind, we will come back to this at a later point when we discuss ammonia the possibility of ammonia as a buffer in the kidney. Till then, we will not consider this pathway. Summarizing, the acids which come into blood due to the various metabolic processes are carbon dioxide due to complete metabolism of glucose, fats and proteins, lactic acid due to incomplete metabolism of glucose just through the glycolytic pathway, ketones coming from free fatty acids, sulfuric and phospho phosphoric acids coming from sulfur and phosphorus containing proteins. We can group these acids in this manner, carbon dioxide separately. This is referred to as a volatile acid because it can be just blown off in the lungs when blood reaches the pulmonary circulation. The other acids, of course, some of the ketone bodies, acetone, can also enter the exhaled air and that is why in conditions like diabetic ketoacidosis, the breath can smell fruity or more like nail polish because of the acetone in breath. But predominantly, these acids require more complex mechanisms for not only maintaining the hydrogen ions released from them in a bound state, not allowing the pH to change. They also need complex mechanisms of excretion involving both lungs and the kidney. In the next few hours, we will first consider how carbon dioxide is handled in the body and then we will move on to how these acids, as against the volatile acid carbon dioxide, these acids are referred to as fixed acids we will consider how the fixed acids are handled by the body. What about the quantum of the acid output? The majority of the acid output due to metabolic processes in cells is in the form of carbon dioxide and about 20,000 millimoles of carbon dioxide enter blood circulation every day. If we considered per kilogram carbon dioxide output for a 70 kg adult male that is the reference human being for physiology. This would translate to 300 millimoles per kilogram body weight per day. In comparison, the fixed acid output is far less. 
it is about 50 to 100 millimoles per day, taking 70 as a convenient value for discussion, 70 millimoles per day in a 70 kg adult male would give a per kg body weight value of 1 millimole fixed acid output per kilogram body weight per day. In addition to knowing the per day output of the volatile and fixed acids, it is also useful to do some calculations to consider the steady state output, that is how much of these acids enter per liter of blood flowing past tissues. So here are the tissues and blood flows through systemic arteries, capillaries and into the systemic veins. And for every liter of blood flowing across the tissues, how much of carbon dioxide and fixed acids enter blood? Let us do some calculations to understand that. We just saw that carbon dioxide output per day is about 20,000 millimoles or 21,000 millimoles. Cardiac output is 5 liters per minute. The amount of blood flowing through tissues, all tissues in the body is 5 liters per minute. The blood volume per se is 5 liters and all of the blood volume in one's body is circulated every minute. That, that's the cardiac output amount of blood pumped out by the heart per minute, that is 5 liters. If we converted this to the amount of blood coursing through tissues every day, we will multiply the 5 liters by 60 minutes an hour and 24 hours a day and we get 7200 liters in a day. There is only 5 liters of blood but it is circulated so many times, renewed and circulated so many times that it is as if 7,000 liters of fresh blood have coursed through tissues in a day. Now we can see that the 20,000 millimoles of carbon dioxide enter about 7,000 liters of blood and that gives us a steady state carbon dioxide output of 3 millimoles per liter of blood coursing through tissues. Let us do a similar calculation for fixed acids. The fixed acid output we saw was about 70 millimoles per day. The cardiac output is that much. So we can say 70,000 micromoles per day by about 7,000 liters per day gives us a fixed acid output of 10 micromoles per liter of blood coursing through tissues. So steady state carbon dioxide output from tissues into blood is 3 millimoles per liter of blood and the steady state output of fixed acids is about 10 micromoles per liter of blood passing through tissues. In the pH notation, if all of this carbon dioxide formed carbonic acid and that protonated to yield equimolar hydrogen ions we would have a pH less than 3. Similarly, if the 10 micromoles, 10 being 10 into 10 to the power minus 6 or 10 to the power minus 5, if all of this were to protonate and yield hydrogen ions, we would have a pH less than 5 in blood. We have already seen that any pH less than 6.8 is incompatible with life. So obviously, there are mechanisms to bind all the protons that are released from carbon dioxide and there are mechanisms to bind all the protons released from fixed acids. These mechanisms will form the subject of the next one or two lectures. Thank you for watching.